We rolling. Let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. <clears throat> Welcome back to episode two of season two, Living the Stress Life podcast. I'm your host, Tiffany Story. And I'm your host with the most, Lamar Story. And this week we are talking about um, the stress of being black. Yeah, I guess. That's yeah. what we talking about. Yeah. <laughs> so this is off on the back of um, Ava DuVernay's When They See Us. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, my wife and I, it took us a while to even to watch it. And so yeah. we watched the first episode last night. Uh, of course, it's the story of the Central Park Five who were uh, wrong, wrongfully convicted um, and were coerced to create a story about raping and uh, killing. Um, Did she die? You know, I don't know. But of uh, raping a white woman in a park. Um, so we watched the first episode last night, and I got to tell you, man, it was like, Really, really hard to watch. First, it was really, really hard to even consider watching it. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, we're familiar with the story. We know it's what happened. You know, they've been exonerated from the, from that and awarded $40 million now. What, how many years later? A lot. Yeah, too many years later. Like 30 years later, I think. So, I mean, we know how things going in America how the black man is treated in America, how black people, period, are treated in America. And this this story, I think what we want to talk about today, though, is just trauma yeah. when it relates to theatrics. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, we suffer from some real PTSD as black folks. And to the point where we can't even watch a movie. I think that what bothers me too, and I, I this I think stays on the forefront of my mind when I'm at work because, you know, I work in a place where there's not many people of color or, or many black people or just people of color, period. Um and so when I am dealing with the girls that are in my program, race constantly comes up. Right. Okay, because most of the girls in your program are what? Most of the girls in my program, um, I run a housing program for homeless young ladies who are pregnant or parenting. And most of the girls that we get in our program are African American. Um, the the reason why race comes up is I have a white staff, a, a wife staff member. So it's well, it's a small team. It's me and myself. Um and two other staff that I have to manage. And one of the ladies are black and one of the ladies are white. And I find that a lot of the black girls are constantly scrutinizing our white staff's intentions, her interactions, her behaviors. They're always looking, they, they looking for her to not be genuine. And she is genuinely straight up sweet person Mm -hmm. you know I really enjoy working with her and what I like is that she's not afraid to discuss bias or ask you know is this a black thing is this a white thing or you know so she's what you consider an ally an ally she's considered an ally so allies are like white people who really want to understand black person's plight. I don't even think an ally is that. I think an ally is a person who tries to see you beyond color. It's a person who really looks beyond what's on the surface. They acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. But what they try to look at is who are you as a person? You know, beyond skin color, beyond gender, beyond ethnicity, nationality, race. I want to know the person. I think that's who an ally is because I don't think just a white person can be an ally. Mm-hmm. Um, but this this particular you know lady is her intentions are constantly questioned, and I think it's because a lot of the girls in our program too 
their interactions with white people have been during traumatic situations in their life, in DHR, court systems, hospitals, and they hadn't always been positive interactions. And so race comes up a lot, you know, and I'm dealing with all these girls who have trauma. And so, you know, one of the things I was saying to Lamar was, I I didn't want to watch when they see us. Yeah. I you know, I deal with trauma on an everyday basis. It's not entertaining for me. Yeah. You know, it's already I'm already processing a lot and having to compartmentalize and decompress from dealing with other people's trauma. Like I prefer to watch something that makes me laugh. Like me and you will sit around and try to think of a movie we want to watch a look through Netflix and you want to watch action or something or something that has some deep storyline. And I'm just like, I just want something that's going to make me laugh. Mm -hmm. There's light. Yeah. And I think, you know, the reality of the situation with this movie, I didn't realize just to give y'all a little something that happened to me. We was with my wife and I was at the movie watching the butler and I didn't realize how much it affected me until I can remember a scene in the movie. And I just like broke down and I cried like for a long time throughout that movie and I couldn't stop crying. And my wife was like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> but it was something in that movie that affected me so, so much so that I just had a, a overflow of just tears, you know? And it was just like, in the back of my mind, I was like, I'm just tired of this. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm tired of being looked at as the bad guy. I'm tired of being looked at as um, not worthy. I'm tired of being looked over. I'm tired of not being looked at. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just kind of like the title of the movie is When They See Us. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It kind of reminds me of that uh, movie with all the blue people. Uh, the movie Avatar. Had, Avatar. And what was that they used to say in the Avatar? I see you. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, that's deep. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, we just want to be seen. Like, we went to a school. Or literally... left alone. Huh? We want to be seen or left alone. That's how I feel anyway. <laughs> or included. It's so much. It's so much. It's like, you want to be included. You want to be seen. You want to be left alone. And I think what you mean by that, left alone, is left alone from all the negative stuff. Yeah, like, like all this people are people. Stuff. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. I just be like, there is too much emphasis and focus on skin color and race. I, I and mean, it's so apparent because, like, we, we both went to Berea College. So we went to a majority white school, which is a very different dynamic from where we grew up. Well, from where I grew up. I was going to say. in California, so you was used to a lot of. Well, not all the way. I, I, I mean, I had a good part of my life, or the earlier part of my life in California, but I had a lot of upbringing. I mean, I've lived in Alabama longer than I lived yeah. in California. So, so you see, it's so segregated here. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got the black side. You got the white side where people live. You got the black church. You got the white church. Um, you got the and the Hispanic area had their own community. Yeah, they got their own. Jewish community. had their own community. So every so segregated here in Alabama, but but what comes with that is the there's no connection mm -hmm. with another person of a different race, right? So it's like, and even though when there is connection, we're always the ones reaching out to the white race. So I mean, like, we're always the ones going to the white church. You know what I mean? Let's let's go and go to the white church. So we can blend in. You know what I mean? But then you leave. Or be accepted. I'm going to say blend in. in. You ain't going to blend in. Let's go and live in the white neighborhood to feel like we belong. You know what I mean? So it's never the opposite. You know, let's go to the black. Well, as far as white folks, let's go to the black church. Or if you do come to the black neighborhood, you take over the whole neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> to where there's no more black people. So it's just... um. I'm just tired of it. And I think a lot of us are tired of it to a point that when this movie came out, even the title of the movie was a trigger. 
Yeah, Ava did it. She, I think she did a really good job. I really like her. I've seen a couple of things that she's done, like a couple of her movies and shows now. And, you know, I'll say for me, I think the issue that I had was, like I said, that I deal with trauma on a regular basis. Um, but I think the struggle for me is I'm beyond that. Like me and Lamar were kind of talking about, you know, how we were going to approach this discussion about when they see us. And, you know, one of the things that he was saying was like, well, it's history. But I'm like, is it really history? Because in order for something to be history, it can't be happening right now. This was 1989 when this took place. Well, it is slavery was history. The slaves didn't happen right now. Yeah, it, it, well, yeah. Like, it, if you look at the prison system, it's just modern day slavery. It is a modern day slavery. But but that is my thing, though. I mean, there are a lot of people coming out saying, can we, can we stop talking about slavery? And I think for me, um, I do think acknowledging your history is important. Knowing who you are, knowing where you came from, knowing... You know, how you move from this place to this place is very, very important. But I also want to move towards solution focused conversation. I want to move towards fixing the issue. And I, I do think there is a lot of talk and a lot of dialogue about how do we address this. Um, but I I'm think. Just, and I think on my part, I'm tired of talking. Like, how many conversations we got to have? How many Dr. Martin Luther yeah. Kings we got to have? How many uh, civil rights movements we got to have? I'm just sick and tired of talking. Sick of it. Sick of it. It's like so many people get paid to talk about this. And ain't shit happening different. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just, I'm just so tired of talking. I want just people to just learn. And I think when it comes back to it, you know, lately, this is very recent for me. It's not, but it is. But it's like the whole concept of love, like connecting, loving, and growing with people, right? And I had a client today that um, she talked to, I can't remember exactly what her theme is for the year. It's somewhat similar to yours, but she was like, I fuck with who fuck with me, period. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So it was just like, I roll with whoever rolls with me. That's better. <laughs> My yeah, mama watching this podcast. Uh, sorry, mama. <laughs> and aunties. Sorry for the language. My apologies. But it's, um, but I am 38, though. I feel like I can say it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I apologize. But, um, but it's like I roll with whoever rolls with me. So it, it's got to get to a point in time where you're just like, you know what? When we were at Berea, if you don't want to lift your head up and look at me, something wrong with you. Well, I... Something's not wrong with me because for it was something that happened to me. And I couldn't remember what it was and I was just so devastated about it. But it was a racial thing. And my mentor at the time said to me that, well, Lamar, you have to realize, oh, I know what it was. I went to go get a client for a massage, right? And she was a white female. And it was two clients that were there together, right? So my client was actually okay with coming with me to go get her massage, but her friend stopped her. Mm -hmm. And was like, no, we requested a female. And I could tell by the way that her friend looked at her that she was lying. Mm -hmm. And so another therapist, a white female therapist, came up. And she was just like, um, what's the problem? And she was like, well, we requested a female. And then the white therapist just looked at her like, well, we don't have another therapist available. Is everything okay? You okay? You know. And so the girl ended up going with me. Mm -hmm. But that whole massage, I was uncomfortable. Mm hmm Cause that's all I could think of why the only thing I could think of was why did this lady just do that? You know I, what I'm saying? So, so it came back like it's not a problem with you. It's a problem with them. Like I don't mind providing this service for you. But when it comes to a point where you got something in your head that you look at me and say, No, I don't wanna go with them. So the problem is not with me. And I think in society, 
we have to learn as black men and black women and black people that those people that have an issue with us, it's their issue. But I think we know reason, that, though. The only reason it becomes our issue because a lot of times they're in the positions of power and it affects us. So then it becomes our issue because it affects how much money we make. It affects if we live or die in a police encounter. You know what I mean? It affects if we get a car or what kind of car we get or what kind of interest rate we get, what kind of neighborhood we can live in because the people that empower when I go and buy a house, if their neighbors have already told them, we don't want these type of people living in this neighborhood, I might not get shown that house. Yeah. We're sick of it. I, I, I want to go back to something, though, that you said um, when you were talking about the lady and going to get her and her friend being uncomfortable, which in turn made you uncomfortable. And I think when I started watching the movie, you know, we've mentioned several times we're parent of three kids. And, you know, I don't, it's crazy because I don't, I don't worry or get as concerned about my daughter, which I should, because, you know, you know, today we're seeing that things are happening to black women just as often as they're happening to black males. But for my boys, you know, I think I'm always concerned and like I'm constantly reminding myself as a parent to pray for them and to cover them and to affirm them and to speak, you know, speak things on them. And I think for me, when we started watching it, we were already planning on watching it, but our oldest son was watching it and before us. And I had very mixed feelings about it because for one, it was talking about things like rape, you know, he's he's just about to be 15. You know, I know that he knows about sex. We've had conversations and I know you guys have regular conversations. But, you know, I think it was the the criminalizing of sex that I, I didn't want him to be exposed to. I also didn't want him to see who he was as a person weaponized. Through their lens. Through their lens. Yeah. And I think, like I said, I don't need trauma as entertainment. Yeah. I deal with trauma on an everyday basis. But I think but I have... Time, hold, on, hold on. Let me finish this off. I have... I, but I have mixed feelings. I There's two sides to my feelings. One side is I don't want those pictures in his mind. And I don't want those pictures to frame how he sees himself. Because when representation is everything, right? That's the whole reason why we want black princesses and black presidents and black attorneys and black doctors, right? Because those representations and those role models allow you to see yourself in a different position. Well, it works both ways. And so when you see another black male, the kid that they were pinning a rape on was 14. And you're a 14 year old boy who's He's a good kid, nice kid, sweet kid, similar to that to the to Kevin, right? Watching that, it frames for you. This could be me. This is me. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Not, to me, I don't see that this is me. But to me, because speaking from a black male's perspective, this could be you. This could be me. So this is the thing. I see. I understand, and I get where you're coming from. But as a black man, I feel like we have to prepare our black boys. And, yes. and I know what you're saying is, I don't want them to see that. At the same time, and not that do I don't want to him to see it. them just a little bit to these things because we live in a place where this happens to us. So we live in a place where the people in power can do this to you. Just like. So, going back, we did allow him to watch the first episode. He actually watched yes, the first, first episode, two, two episodes. Episodes. So, he's ahead of us. And so, we called him in the room because we watched the first episode after him. So, we called him in the room and, you know, just to get his thoughts and feelings about it. No, it was like, actually time to go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, man, I almost cried. I don't even know why. I said, because you're human. I said, and this is a true story. He didn't realize that this was a true story. This is how innocent he is. He didn't realize 
Even I wanted to be a police officer when I was growing up. Until police officers um, did me wrong. So, and I think every little boy wants to grow up and be a police officer because we see them as heroes. They want to grow up and be a hero. Not everyone want to be a police officer. So, in our eyes, it was, it's for me, a police officer was a hero. Mm-hmm. So, when I seen a police officer, I was like, man, this is a hero. You know what I'm saying? I want to do that when I grow up because he looked like he, he was like our Superman because Superman wasn't real. Police officers to us was like our Superman. You know what I'm saying? They had these vests, they had these guns, they had um, these nice, these cool cars, and you know what I'm saying? And they were supposed to protect us. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's all what superheroes do is protect the people who can't protect themselves. And then they become villains when you realize that you've been, yes. your skin color has been weaponized. Yes. So then we had the opportunity to talk to our son about this first episode. We talked to all three of our kids. Yeah, all three of them about this first episode and say, hey, do you see what happened when they separate y'all? I said, if you was to ever get in a situation, like it, it became a teaching moment. I said, they separate you and they're going to play you against each other just like they did. Yeah. They're going to say, oh, your friend uh, Alonzo said you did this. And in your head, you're like, why would Alonzo say that? No, I didn't do this. It, and then they're going to make you mad at him. And you're like, no, Alonzo did. You know, then y'all, they going to pitch y'all against each other. And I told him, I said, son, will you ever get in a situation like this? First of all, you ask for your parents. And you ask for an attorney. All right? So this is where you don't say nothing. But I think make sure your friends don't say nothing. The problem with this movie, though, and several people have pointed this out, is that they didn't know their rights. The parents were ignorant of what was right. And my thing is, if it don't feel right, it ain't right. Even if you don't know the law to the letter, if it don't feel right, it's not right. But I think a part of me just, it just, it made me angry. You know, as a mother, to just think of someone cornering my kid and making him to be something that he's not. Mm -hmm. It's just not okay. And I think for me, the other side, you know, is that it is traumatic and he can start to see himself as the character. But the other side is I want him to be able to envision himself to be president. I want him to be able to envision himself to be whoever he wants to be. And I don't want to put those with no limitations because this is my thing. Only God can judge me. Only God, I feel like only God can dictate what barriers I can't overcome, what doors close. And so I really want him to get to a place too where he can really say to himself, it does not matter what barrier you put in my way. You know what I'm saying? I know who I am and I know whose I am. Like, I don't know at what age I came to this conclusion that I wasn't looking for the world's approval. It was young. I remember like being real skinny when I was little. I was scrawny Mm -hmm. and people teasing me and trying to make me feel insecure about being skinny. And I I just remember one day waking up and being like, I'm good. Like, Mm -hmm. this really ain't a problem. It didn't become an issue for me until everybody else started making it an issue. Right. And it's just something inside of me that just was like that you I don't need the world's validation. I'm mm-hmm. I'm content in who I am. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's just it's just me and God. And I want my kids to have that. I want them to realize like inside of me when it comes down to breaking me who I am in, in spirit. Like I say all the time, I couldn't have been a slave. I would have been a dead slave. Mm-hmm. Like I wouldn't have made it very far. You know what I'm saying? Because the thing about it is, you're not going to break me. You know what I'm saying? It don't matter what barrier you put in front of me, 
you will not define me. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I want my kids to have that. Mm-hmm. And I want them to have that because when you get cornered in a room and somebody says, if you lie, you can go home. Yeah. You'll say, that does not align with my principle. I am not going to confess to and rape. That's why they need to have both sides. Now, I understand you. But at the same time, just like we show him people who are successful, mm-hmm. just like we show him going to the ends to help club. This, this is owned by a black man. This whole block over here is owned by a black man. This block. Shout out here, to Spurlin. And yeah, shout out to Antonio Spurlin. Shout out to Brian Rice. Shout out shout to out, Brian. Shout out to Lamar Story. Yeah, <laughs> Lamar. Shout out to my Matt. <laughs> but um, but this is what you can do, in spite of these things. But you need to be aware of these things because when it happened to me. I thought I could have a conversation with a police officer. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And it don't happen like that. Yeah. And then this police officer was black. And, it's and so, so, and that's 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 even worse to me because I'm like, we're teenagers walking out of a mall, and because there was some stolen property on the outside of the mall, we had just walked out of the mall. Now we pinned up against the wall. The white police officer, we telling him, like, look, we literally just came out the mall. Well, what y'all doing? We seen, at the time, it was a Nintendo 64 that just came out. It was KB Toy Story at Western Hills Mall. And we seen a Nintendo 64 box outside. And so we was like, it can't be no Nintendo 64 in that box. You know what I'm saying? So we went over there to look and see, was it a Nintendo 64 in the box? Next thing, no, we up against the wall. So we thinking like, no, sir, we just came over here to see what it was. Somebody left their Nintendo 64 outside. Mm-hmm. Get up against the wall. Patting us down. The white police officer's like, they don't have no Nintendo 64. Black police officer's like, nah, they probably the ones that's doing it. Like, really? Yeah. Where is that, though? He doesn't care. <laughs> Where did the Nintendo 64 at? I'm sorry. I'm disappointed. And this dude is still a police officer in Fairfield. He's a detective now. Is that the one? Like, I still have to see him. He don't remember who I am, but I remember him clear as day. Just like I remember the white police officer with the eye patch that was in Fairfield that pulled a gun out on some 10 and 12 year olds in a car. Mm-hmm. For no reason. That's that stuff still hunts me. I see them. They have no idea who I am now. But every time I see them, I'm like, that's them motherfuckers. <laughs> well, I think I mean I think all of us well not all of us, but I think many people man. can recount situations like that. I mean, I had a situation as an adult. Where I was accused of doing something, had to go to court, and was found guilty. Yeah, of something not, that was trippy. Yeah, and I mean, and then after the case was dismissed, after I had to appeal it, an attorney pulls me into the room, starts talking to me without my lawyer present, and wanted me to sign something. I said I have to wait on my attorney. Right, I let it go because I was tired of it, but I also regret that because he was like, "Well, don't say anything to your attorney." Because I'm not supposed to be talking to you. And see, they get over on people who don't know. Well, the thing about it is, I knew my attorney needed to be present. I wasn't okay with signing Yeah, you know what I'm saying? But if you were somebody that did know. Exactly. He knew. He was like, let me see what kind of black chick this is. Because it was like, let me see if this one of them, them low-class black chicks who don't know they rights. You know what I'm saying? So I'm going to go in here and see if I can get her to sign this piece of paper real quick. That's the same thing they did in this movie. And I think that's what bothered me so much that this is not drama. This is not this theater. Is real life. This is real life. Yeah. And I think now what bothers so many people, the fact that everybody is having to prepare themselves to watch a recount of history. That we already know. That we already know. You can Google it, you can read the facts, but to see it is traumatic. And and beyond that, to see it from the perspective of being a black person in America. You know what I'm saying? And I think for me, 
it's really one of those things where I'm just like, at this point in my life, it should not be stressful for me to have to watch a movie. It should not be stressful for me to um, to have a conversation with my kid about what they need to do to stay safe. And so I think as I... I don't know. I, I, I'm I'm gearing up and trying to prepare myself for watching the other parts of the movie. But I don't know if I am. I, I definitely want to because I want to be able to have dialogue with my kids. But at the same time, I don't think personally I want that type of stress because I'm in a place in my life right now where it's like I know this is happening. This will not be the storyline. I made a decision. I've claimed it. I spoke it. I believe it. That this is not this is not going to be the situation for my my children. This won't ever be them, you know. And it's so funny because my my best friend. I went to Ohio um, to visit my best friend Stephanie. Um, she appeared on one of our live recordings for season one but her oldest son graduated from high school and we were just having a conversation and I just busted out laughing because she was like I managed to actually get a kid through high school and to successfully to the age of 18 without any kids or going to jail or like he's still alive he's not dead and, it, a and yeah, and it's so funny because I started laughing like, what does that mean? But, but as you know, I process you know what, though, that, you know what though? This is so interesting. A lot of black men when they turn twenty one, what do you think they say? I, I have no idea. I made it. I said it. I've heard so other so many other black men say that, like when at the age of twenty one, you're like. Man, I made it just be alive at 21 years old. And that's deep. That's a reality. That's for so that's deep. deep. It's so deep. And I didn't think about how deep it was. Like, I laughed, like, what does that mean? Like, why would you kill a child? But then I processed it. It wasn't just so much like I managed to keep this kid alive, like, I didn't kill him. But it's also that I managed to get a kid through high school and he's still alive at age 18 and he's had a good life. He ain't had to deal with the police. He ain't had to deal with drugs. I ain't had to deal with drugs. I ain't had to deal with violence. I ain't had to deal with no baby mama drama. Like, I managed to get a kid to successfully become an adult without him being traumatized. And I'm like, man, because I can't say that. I can't say that I reached the age of 18 without being traumatized. I have some sort of trauma in my life. You can't say that you made it to the age of 18 without trauma, right? But currently, as it stands right now for our children, I can say for the most part, their life has been trauma free. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, you got things like the tornadoes or gunshots in the neighborhood. But other than that, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. They have not experienced any real danger. You know what I'm saying? I think it was traumatic for them when that situation happened to you. At, what was it, Kmart? What's traumatic for Jaden? Because Jada and Justin were really little, but he I was five or six. And that's all I can do is hear my kids crying when you call. Mm-hmm. And it was the dumbest situation ever. 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 You want to talk about the situation? So, situation is I went to Kmart to go pick up some uniforms. I was looking for specific some specific uniforms at Walmart, but they sell out really quickly. This is when the kids were wearing uniforms. So I had put some uniforms on layaway at Kmart just in case I couldn't get the uniforms I wanted. Well, unfortunately, by the time I got around to shopping, all the uniform pants that I wanted at Walmart were gone. So I decided to go get my layaway from Kmart. I get to Kmart. My daughter had just uh, fallen asleep. And so I decided to put her in an umbrella stroller, which was my youngest son's stroller. When he saw that she was in her stro- her his stroller, he started having 
like a tantrum in a parking lot. I was tired. We had been at the school orientation because my son was starting first grade at a new school and all this stuff. So I decided when I got into the store that I was going to put her in the back of a buggy. I put the umbrella stroller under the basket and I put my youngest son in the front of the basket. Well, because she was asleep and I couldn't get her to wake up, I threw my purse over in the buggy and I started looking for a blanket because she needed a blanket for daycare or for pre, I think she was in preschool, for preschool for nap time. So I found a blanket and unrolled it and put it on my purse. Well, what I didn't know is when I did that, the loss prevention person started following me around the store. Now, I saw the guy following me around the store, but at the time, I thought he was trying to talk to me because I'm used to people trying to talk to me. He didn't look like he worked for Kmart. First of all, you got on a tall tee that stop at your knees. You got gold in your mouth. He got uh, the little slashes cut in his eyebrows. So I, you know, I'm looking at him. He looking at me. Well, me looking at him is suspicious. But you following me. Every time I turn around, I see you posted up. It's suspicious to me. Right. So I go back to the the back counter where they do the, the layaways and the person who was in front of me, they lost their layaway. So I ended up being in the store for about an hour. So I forgot to pay for the blanket. And so I paid, I spent over a hundred some dollars paying for the layaway. I'm walking out of the store. The guy waits till I leave out the store and tells me that I have something in my buggy that I didn't pay for. It was like a $17 blanket. So he says, I need to follow him to the back. Now, first of all, I thank him. I was like, oh my God, thank you. I was like, I don't want nobody to think I'm stealing. That should have been your first cue that I did not recognize that you were actually following me around the store. Because Jada was asleep on the plane. She was still, she was still asleep. Yeah. So, and I had been in the store in line for 45 minutes. I had been in the store a total of like an hour, but I had been in in the line for 45 minutes. So I, he says, no, ma'am, I need you to follow me back to the back of the store. When I finally processed that, he thought I was stealing. I was like, okay, yeah, ain't no big deal. Cause I know I didn't steal anything. So there we go again, thinking that we can just have a general conversation with. Well, I just thought it was a mis- yeah, misunderstanding. misunderstanding. Okay, it's a misunderstanding. We go back in here and get it cleared up. And I didn't leave the store completely. He waited till I walked out of the door. Like he stood there and watched me walk out of the door. Now, I didn't notice he was watching me until after he stopped me, but he watched me walk out the door. But long story short, I get to the back. They snatched my daughter out the buggy, said I had stuff, stuff in my purse. I was like, y'all can search my purse. The police end up getting called. They let me leave, but I had to basically turn myself into jail. I had to take pictures. I had to get an attorney. I went to court. They kept continuing the case. Over $17. Over blanket. $17 blanket. And then this was the this was the kicker. When we got to court five months later, after they didn't continue the case, the guys did not even remember me and they were making up facts. So something that was traumatic to me, they was like, yes, yeah, she had a box full of stuff we couldn't see. I was like, I had a clear bag of clothes that was hanging. And I spent over some a hundred something dollars. They they didn't even know who I was. The judge found me guilty. I had to appeal it. And then they didn't want to so go the through judge found you guilty. because I admitted that I walked out the store with a blanket. That's all they care. None of the other details matter. All that matters is that I said that I actually exited that first door. I didn't even make it into the parking lot. Exited the first door with a blanket. And because of that, he said guilty. And I was at Homewood, mind you. This happened in Homewood. So basically, by the time I made it to Jefferson County, they end up dismissing the case as long as I agreed not to sue the store or try to pursue anything. And by that, and, and by the time we reached there, it had been seven months. I had to pay an attorney. I had been back and forth to court. I had a, I had something on my record. You know what I'm saying? The kids were traumatized. Yeah, I mean, and after that, my son would ask me, did I pay for stuff? He would say, mama, did you pay for that? And I'm like, son, I don't steal. Like yeah. I, it took me two years to convince him that I didn't steal. Yeah. All because basically I was a mother who looked like a young mother. I'm 30. So I was, I, I might've been, no, it was right before I turned 30. I was almost 30 years old. I got three kids, but because I looked like I was some young black mom, they pegged me from the, I mean, the time I walked to the, 
through the door that guy started following me. I hadn't even made it a good 10 feet in the store when he started following me. You know what I'm saying? And so it was just like, this is the reality. This is the reality. And I've been through that situation, but I remember sitting in the courthouse and seeing so many other people in there that did not know their rights. And they was finding them guilty. They was giving them these um, court-appointed attor- attorneys. This whole law thing is a dirty, dirty game. It, it's, it's just pimping game. people of their money. Yeah. It's keeping the poor poor and making you slaves. And I think for me, the movie, when they see us, I know it's real, but I don't need that. I don't need that type of stress in my life. Honestly, I want to talk to my kids so that they understand, you know, what the reality is. And but I'm give you my perspective. I think Ava DuVernay for this because yes. the reason I think her thank her is because this allows me to when my son said he cried, it's not much that gets his attention. I tried just talking to him about things that can happen to us. I we watch documentaries together and they kind of like go over his head, but for some reason this right here, it hit him, and I needed he's 14. to yes, but I needed to hit him because I need him to understand that we all go through this world thinking that things won't happen to us. Emmett Till probably went through this world thinking like this is not gonna happen to me. I went through this world thinking like this is not going to happen to me. You know what I'm saying? So the more that I am consciously aware aware of my surroundings, of the powers that be and how they think about us, the better off I am. It gives me power. So I believe I am going to watch the next one. And I want him to watch it because this is going to give us some talking points. And I think it's, it's, he's feeling it. And I don't think he, I think as long as you are a parent and you are right there with them and you can help your child through this, through this movie, you can help your child um, through any movie, for real, to be honest. We let our children watch too much stuff without us. But specifically this movie, if you can help them and teach them and, and talk to them through these teachable moments, I think it will help them throughout the rest of their life um, see the world view of African Americans. And it's sad, but it's a sad reality. <laughs> so, I guess I'm at a point where I it's, it's up in the air. It's up in the air whether I'm going to finish watching it. Even now, I feel like I'm on the brink of crying. Like, I'm angry. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll tell, I will say this. I will say this. It couldn't have been me. There is no way in hell or earth or heaven that I would have allowed my son to be railroaded. You know what I'm saying? There is there is no there is no part of this world or this earth that I would not have scorched behind you trying to steal my kids innocent. You know what I'm saying? And I bet every mom feels like that. You know, I I know so many of us feel like that. And so I think for me I, what I would like to go with this discussion is how did we deal with this? So I think for our tips of the day, that's what we need to talk about. Tips for the day. Let's do it. So tips of the day. What are your tips, babe? Mm, geez, I'm calling <laughs> Would you like me to go first? Um, you know, one thing that, that J. Cole song was saying in my head. Which one? Um, I don't know the name of it. But um, he was talking about Love Yours. Is that the name of it? Like, he was talking about everybody life. Mm-hmm. But you need to learn how to love yours. Right? Mm-hmm. I think it goes the same thing about your people. You know, I think as, as long as you're here in America, 
um, there's a systemic um, reason reason why they treat black people the way they are. It's just systemic. Um, it's about survival of the fittest. It's about um, people not wanting to one day not be here. Um, and somehow they look at us as the um, the melanin is powerful. Yeah. The melanin is very powerful. And um, and it's not our fault. It's not your fault how you were born. But I think you need to, to learn how to love yourself. Mm-hmm. Always love others. But, but be aware of the world around you. That's my tip of the day. And I think we need to learn how to love each other more. We need to learn how to connect with each other more. Um, we need to learn how to grow with each other more. Right? So it's all about the connect, love, grow with me and what I see. Um, of course, I have black clients. I have white clients. And I've had clients that have been with me for over 10, 12 years consistently. And it's all about that connection, right? And it's and when we can get back to the root of it all, is you know, get away from the cell phones, get away from uh, all this external stuff and just come back to basic human connection and actually being seen, right? Trust that energy that when somebody don't really see you, they don't see you. They don't value your life. So whether you're a parent and you, you're deciding to take your child to a daycare center and you go in that daycare center and those people don't see you, don't take your child to that daycare center. If you're at a school and you know that the teacher in that school, your son or your, your daughter keeps coming back to you and saying they don't feel comfortable in that school and that teacher don't see them, take that child out of their school. We have to be seen. And when I say me to be seen is they need to feel my presence. They need to be able to look at me in my eyes 